This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Welcome to the show. This is a chat that's been in the pipeline for a long time. I present a conversation with Matt Harvey. Now, he's the frontman and guitarist in Exhumed. He's in Gruesome, but now I can add solo artist to his very extensive resume. He's got a new album out. It's under his own name. It's called Toward the Cold Light. It's a departure from what you are used to from Matt. And in this chat, he shares his motivations driving his solo ambitions, and he reflects on personal and musical development. We explore the thematic underpinnings and the diverse influences that shape the album, which is very cinematic and it has a soundtrack-like quality. Of course, we talk about Exhumed, Gruesome, and he's got a bit of a tale to share about what happened at the Brisbane show, which I unfortunately missed. If you're listening via the podcast apps, I've got a tune to share with you. This is the title track from the solo album, Toward the Cold Light. Once it's done, we'll dive into the chat. You good people on YouTube, you know the drill, can't play music, so you'll hear from Matt right now. Either way, let's go. Hi there. Sorry I'm late, man. No, bro. That's fine, mate. How's it going? It's, it's going good. Yeah. So the last interview I had ran over and I was like, I wasn't looking at the clock and it was a whole thing. So I, I apologize. No, no dramas at all. It, it's, well, it hints at a good thing, mate. This new project of yours, there's some demand to talk to you about. It. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's surprising and, and nice. <laughs> was that uh, Was that something that, that you thought about before you started this, that you would have to do conversations and the Zuma grinds, as I call them, and 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 have the type of <laughs> <laughs> have the type of questions that you've been asked have have they been interesting? Have people been engaging? Yeah, they they have been interesting because um, you know I guess after having done a lot of your interviews over the mm-hmm. years, you know, especially for examples, and I've I've. I've gone over a lot of the same ground many times. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas this is something that, you know, even if I've gotten some stuff that has been a little repetitive, it's something that I've only sort of said maybe like six or seven times rather than like 666 <laughs> times, you know? So, and it's cool. Like I, I kind of, I guess I've learned a long time ago. The only way to sort of get through talking about the stuff over and over is to just sort of, uh, I don't know, try and get like some new insight and some new clarity in, into it, you know, because a lot of times we do stuff where we're just like, I don't know, I just did it just because. And then yeah. as you talk through it, you can kind of start like unpacking it a little bit, or at least I, that's what I try to get out of it. Yeah. But what the question, the main question I have for you is I enjoy it, by the way. It's, it's cinematic, vast, uplifting, mournful. Okay, but the inspiration behind this this right turn, if you like, in this solo journey for you, what was it? Um, it's hard to say there was any one thing. I mean, the main thing I think for me is like I've always liked the old kinds of music. I mean, even back, you know, in high school, I was listening to you know Cocteau Twins and and fucking. <clears throat> Sonic Youth and and yeah. Neubauten and whatever you know stuff that had nothing to do with with metal, um, but I think a lot of it has to do with in the last several years, kind of getting a little bit more confident, just in terms of being able to execute ideas that I might have had, you know. Yeah. Um, whereas before, I'm like, oh, it'd be cool if blank, and then you know that was it. Um, but now with sort of the, the the advances in technology and my own kind of experience growing as far as like audio engineering and and <clears throat> writing and arranging stuff i kind of have the confidence to to attempt to execute some things that before would have just been like oh that's a neat thought and then you know never would have gone any further mm. um so i mean that's sort of like the 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 broad answer um the specific answer is just like last the winter of 2023, like at the beginning of the year, um, I, my, my wife at the time had a job where she was getting up for work really early. So I would get up early every morning and I would go outside and walk our dogs and it would be sort of before, you know, just before sunrise. So it's not really light. It's not really dark. 
we live pretty close to the coast in a kind of a rural area. So there's a lot of fog and mm. trees and mist and shit. And, and it was just sort of like, you know, 40 minutes in that environment, you know, day after day, sort of, it's really quiet and kind of otherworldly. And it's a good kind of time to be introspective. And, and, you know, this was sort of the music that came out of all that, you know? That's that's great. Yeah, I can relate to that. I live somewhere similar in, in Australia, obviously, but uh, yeah. yeah, just I can't live here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, Where, it's whereabouts are you? Gold Coast. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So not terribly far from Brisbane, then. Spot on. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I missed your show recently. I'm sorry about that. It was one of those things just with kids and everything else coming up. But I'm really good mates with uh, Rob and the guys in Laceration Mantra. Oh, Big, awesome! Big, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, who said it was a great show, by the way, the Brisbane show. It was a, it was a very killer show. The, the, I think the funniest, I remember that Brisbane gig specifically because there was this really drunk woman um, <laughs> who was too old to be that drunk. Like, she was probably, like, 40. Um, yeah. You know, she's a good-looking lady, you know, no, not, not throwing any shade, but she was, like, right over of our bass player, and, like, I think she, like, showed the band her ass, and then her boyfriend got super pissed. And then they started just having like a domestic, like in as we're playing, you know, everyone's like rocking out, do whatever. You just look over and you just see these two like shouting at each other. And I was like, man, this is good fun, man. <laughs> it's nice to be back in Australia. You guys, you guys know how to have fun. Yeah, it's a, it sounds fairly typically Brisbane too, I've got to say. Yeah. I <laughs> love it. If it was going to happen in any, any Australian city, it would have been Brisbane, I think, in the one there. Yeah. All right. Perfect. I'll never forget years ago, this is decades ago, but uh, when uh, Deicide and Cannibal Corpse came through, uh, there's, these, there's this group, I mean, it's a, it's a common name, but we call them the Brisbane Dickheads. And they, they were spitting on, I mean, Glenn Benton, for God's sake, they were spitting on him. Yeah, he, he threatened to rip the, he, he actually wanted to get jump into the crowd and rip them in half. I was going to say, that sounds unwise. Yeah, well, he was skipping songs in the set. This is 2006. And then... Yeah. And yeah. months before that, they tried it with uh, with George from Cannibal Corpse as well. And, oh shit! Uh, also it, unwise. Yeah, it used to, it was a rough city to play in back in the day. It wasn't um, it wasn't pleasant. I mean, that's that's a bit humorous that one there. But you'd go to gigs, and I remember you'd have to be careful about what band t shirt you wore. I'd often just stand off to the side and just wait and see the carnage unfold. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, but it, it's uh, such a nice city, though. Like it's. <laughs> gorgeous weather it's beautiful like it's really i don't know it's just i i, I don't know I, it doesn't i'm not make sure sense. Where, yeah <laughs> where that's coming from. it's the heat the heat makes people go a bit crazy after a period of time i think once you've moved here yeah gotcha okay fair enough what about was, was there any just talking about toward the cold light was, was there any challenging aspects of it though creating it um, I think the most challenging thing about it really is just, you know, when you're used to working in a, in a in a band setting and you've been doing it for a long time, you sort of have that confidence of like, well, we've made, you know, four other albums that people seem to enjoy enough for the label to keep giving us money to keep making these things and yeah. people keep turning up to the gig. So I guess we're, you know, you have that that confidence. And then you also have the confidence in your bandmates to be like, Hey, this song isn't working, or this section's not good, or whatever. Um, whereas this, you know, it's just it's, it's much like being out in those mornings, maybe writing this music and and engineering it. It's very solitary, so you know you you don't have that feedback, and and also I'm doing something that is, you know, kind of outside my my comfort zone, which is what's mm. kind of stimulating to me, but it's also just sort of it's challenging to to be like, is this good, or is do I just think it's good because I worked on it for six hours today? Yeah. <laughs> so um, that aspect is a bit daunting, you know. Um, yeah. And just the 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 and just the pure engineering side of it, um, you know, you're like, well, I wanted to have this thing. Fuck, how do I do that? Um, I didn't go to like audio engineering school or anything. I've just been sort of learning by doing on the fly. So there's definitely every record I end up working on. There's something that I've learned that I'm like, Oh fuck. I should have known that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. So, so 
it sounds like one of the most one of the more challenging aspects is you didn't have anybody to bounce ideas off. You just had to accept that okay, if you thought it was a good idea, it was. Yeah, and I mean, I, you know, it's not like I I have friends who who I would send things to or whatever, but it's also like. You know, I know from being that person for other people, it's like I love to get stuff from my friends and tell them what I think about it, but I don't love to get like 50 slightly different iterations of it. You know right. what I mean? I'm like, just send me the very beginning of the idea and then send me when you're almost done. And so it's that middle stretch where you're like, well, if I just pan this, if I just turn this up or if I change this voice or add this extra measure or whatever. Yeah. And that's where you can kind of get into second guessing yourself, especially because we have, uh, with Exhum, we built our own recording studio, uh, like I guess four years ago now, four and a half years ago. So I'm just here by myself. I got nothing but time, you know. <laughs> I have all the time to, to overthink and overanalyze and second guess and go down every rabbit hole. And it's um, it's a tough. I try really hard to stay away from it, but it's not always successful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, you, your answer is not so much that it surprised me be up the top about when you wrote the album and the inspiration behind it, but it to me it sounded as though it was one of those COVID things, things that you got inspired to do because we all had that time off. Sure. Well, the engineering side of it is 100% a COVID thing because um, I had sort of a weird journey. Um about 10 years ago, I started using tablature for everything because um, with Exude, we've had a lot of different members. And then, you know, we also have people that will come and fill in for us. And once I started, once I really got over the learning curve of just using tablature for everything, I started getting like obsessive about it. And so I would, whatever ideas I had, I would just tab out and then come back to them later. And then I just, my whole sort of concept of writing music shifted because I just realized like, I don't even necessarily need a fucking guitar. I can just sort of, if I know, you know, I have a sense of where the intervals are. I can just sit here and compose music just anywhere. I do it on a fucking plane or a car ride or whatever. And then I realized that I was like, wait a second, I can write music for any instrument like this. It doesn't have to be guitar. It doesn't have to be drums. It could be like an oboe or whatever. Yeah. And then when COVID happened, I finally had the time to be like, so I know you can take, you know, this music that you're composing and then give it instrumental voices that sound pretty realistic. And then I, while I was at home for those first few months, I just sort of deep dove into that. And that was sort of where, you know, it's taken a, a few years now, like two or three years, really, I guess at this point of learning and and being like oh my god i just i got it to like oh fuck i don't know shit and that's happened like you know five or six times or whatever and so this is sort of a snapshot i guess of where uh, i'm at in that process because you know i want it to sound you know at least partially organic obviously some of it's yeah. synth stuff but you know when you hear a violin i want you to think oh violin i don't want you to think oh synthesizer you know yeah, yeah. hey look ai AI. Uh, be well beyond chat GPT and Dali, it's writing music these days. So was there a temptation for you to integrate any AI into what you were doing? Uh, no, uh, you know, I, I recognize that AI is, is the, you know, future of lots of stuff. Um, and I guess, you know, I've, my reaction is like, okay, so this, maybe this is my like old man jumping off point. Maybe this is where I'm like, okay, I was, I was down with all this, this technology, but this is a bridge too far for me. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, people are like, oh, chat, you can, you can write this, you can write that. And I'm thinking like, you know, it's, it's discouraging, but it also sort of, I guess, it reinforces to me that the more, essential human component maybe isn't even creating stuff. It's being able to react to stuff because you know what I mean? Like you, you react to seeing a waterfall or whatever the fuck you're into. I don't know. Maybe it's a forest or maybe it's a desert or Mesa in the distance or plant. Um, you react to that the same way you react to a piece of music or, you know, prose or poetry or a, a painting. And so maybe that's really the most important thing it's more important than the creative aspect is the ability to 
read, listen, experience something, and then have a feeling about it. Because it's like, sure, maybe Chad GBT can write a haiku, but Chad GBD can't be like, oh, I'm moved by this because of whatever. So yeah. I don't know. I, I'm, the whole thing just is kind of a fucking drag. <laughs> uh, it's like the, 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 when the tool has no use for the, the user, it's great if it's an assembly line making cars and it's just a fucking robot that tightens bolts all day because who the fuck wants to tighten a bolt? Mm-hmm. But when it's writing or composing music or making, you know, drawings, pictures or whatever, that's sort of, uh, I don't know, to me, it's just a depressing prospect. So, Look, the DSI, Glenn and, and Steve haven't come out and said this directly, but their new album, I- the cover, I mean, I'll, I'll place 100 bucks now that it was an AI cover. Have you seen That's it? What I've been yeah. Uh, yeah, I haven't seen it. Um, but I, I'm every everything I've been hearing from, you know, I have friends who are, you know, they work in graphic design and fucking, you know, software back end shit, and that's what they said. And I don't know. I'm just like, yeah, you know, sure, you saved a couple hundred bucks, uh, you know, paying your guy, but just why? I, I don't know. It just yeah. seems like. It's like a a needless improvement or whatever. It's like, I don't know, man, art is already pretty sick. Like, <laughs> and I mean, I, I guess Deicide's thinking is honestly like, and I could be totally off base. You know, I don't know them personally. So I've no, this is my conjecture. So don't, let's not say Deicide. Let's say a legacy band that chooses to use AI artwork. Yeah. They're thinking to be like, you know what? All people ever buy is the fucking first album cover t-shirt anyway so who gives a fuck about this artwork yeah. like we're putting out this you know we think the record's good and we think the artwork's cool but realistically this is going to be like 10 percent of our merch sales for two years and then we'll everyone will forget about it and we'll go back to you know then it'll be the next album and people will still keep buying the first two or three album designs anyway so who fucking cares um i think that's a shitty attitude but that's why I have my own band and can make my own decisions is so I can make so decisions true. that I am cool with, you know, but I, I have to think that it's a tempting idea because I don't know, man, if I went to a DSI show, no shade, DSI is a great band. I would buy the first album shirt because actually for some reason, never got one back when I was in high school and it was a new <laughs> shirt, but it's like, that's what I would buy. So it's like, I guess, you know, maybe there's some wisdom to like, who gives a fuck about this design? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Yes, but spoken really well. Actually, it's probably the best best take on it I've spoken to somebody about or even read. Actually, so if Blabbermouth yeah. pick up on anything, mate, let him pick up on that. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like you know, you can get mad. I'm not mad about AI. I find it mildly depressing, but it's just like man, people are going to do what they're going to fucking do. Yeah, it's a tool. People will use it. I don't feel comfortable with it, so I can just make my decision. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, you, you are you are still on the tools from the perspective that uh, you did the, the beautiful videos to accompany um, the tracks as well. I've enjoyed watching them. Oh, it, thanks. Was that a labor of love as well? You know, it, I, it was one of those things where I just, I, I feel like the in a weird way, the video component is more important really in now than it has been since like the heyday of MTV in like the mid eighties or whatever, because, you know, people use YouTube to stream, you know, like that's like their Spotify or their record collection or whatever. So it's like, well, you, you know, and if you're going to, well, if you want people to, to watch it, you know, to, to listen to music on video on YouTube, rather, that's not a known commodity. You should probably have some sort of video element to it so it's not just like a screen like you know and um ross our bass player in exam he turned me on to the internet archive and there's all kinds of shit on there there's you know um just old public domain movies there's like educational films magazine articles like just it's endless right. and one of the things that kind of intrigued me is that there's like just old home movies that people took and stuff right. and so i just went down a rabbit hole of, you know, looking at old educational movies and, and people's home movies. And because I think the music is sort of nostalgic, you know, kind of bittersweet, melancholy or whatever. Um, I, I thought that that 
you know, using the older public domain stuff was just, uh, it just fit the vibe. Like, and, and some of them I just really lucked out on. I was just like, I found a video. I was like, fuck, this is perfect. It's just, you know, go on iMovie, edit, edit, edit. All right, cool, done. And I try not to like think too much about it, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it was, I, I thought about the idea for like a month and then I did it all in like, you know, two nights. <laughs> um, so I, I, I don't know if it's a labor of love, but I, I think that the idea worked uh, and I, I like the videos actually a lot. Like, you know, it's one of the only albums I've ever made where my parents are like, oh, I watched all your videos. Like, they're really good. Okay. Usually they're just like, why the fuck would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's great. You've already talked about legacy and, and uh, doing those types of videos is very important from that perspective too because, yes, they're, they're a moment in time, but they're also an artifact. And in right. 10, who knows how long YouTube is going to be around. That's a it's something to ponder for another day maybe but i tell you what you know in in 10 15 years time when you look back and you're having a whiskey or whatever you might be it's it's quite visceral so you can you can get engaged in it if you just want time out from to your point walking the dogs in the morning and taking the kids to right. school and all those other things I, I i like it i think it's very important that you've done it oh thanks man thank you um yeah i, I was really happy with how they came out and i was kind of shocked at, at how fast like I said, I did it over just like two nights sticking around in my spare yeah. bedroom. <laughs> yeah, internet archive. That's the first time I've heard that being used. I didn't even uh, realize it was something that you could tap into. So it's all public domain content, is it? It's mostly public domain. There's definitely some stuff up there that, uh, you know, I'm sure it, it's stuff that like nobody would bother legal action with. Like yeah. uh, I'm a big comic book fan. So like I downloaded like the, the Doctor Strange 1978 TV movie, which was terrible. <laughs> but I found it there, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. you know, some old like cartoons and stuff from the 60s, you know, like Teen Titans cartoons from the 60s, like the, I mean, you can find them there. Um, but like the educational uh, videos we use a lot. Uh, we didn't have it when we came to Australia, but with Exhum, we have uh, video monitors going through the whole show. Mm. And so there's a lot of like medical instruction videos and stuff that we use shit from. Uh, so it's uh, it's very it's really useful for sort of uh, I don't know just background imagery or whatever you know just yeah. to kind of things up a little bit. Yeah, instead of having to spend five hundred to you know, well not even five hundred bucks, mate. They're bloody expensive stock images. Why? Why? Not? Oh yeah. Yeah, stock images and stock video. I've got iStock. Where I, I'm a journo, so during the daytime I use iStock and Adobe Stock, and the videos are a bloody fortune, mate. But you don't want to be sued. That's the bloody issue with it. Sure. And I was like, you know, if if these videos get enough views to where like somebody's gonna be like, hey, that's my family's old one movie. You got to take that down. I'd be like, fuck, my video got a lot of views. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a different video. It's cool. What's well, yeah. all public domain? It's uh, at that point. It's it should be yes. what it is. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm going to cast your mind back to the distant past. If that's cool, to 2004 uh, when you did a show in Mexico with Exodus. Yeah, yeah. What What are your memories of that? Um, it was an interesting time. Was it two? Was it oh four? Was it? I want to say it was oh five or oh six. Because I think it exhumed it split up by them. I don't know, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, it was a weird time because exhumed was either a, like had just split up or was about to split up. And, um, but I kind of at slightly kind of knew the Exodus guys because when they got back together with Bailoff, like at the end of the 90s, um, I must have seen them. I probably saw them like. 15 times like the first year that they were playing and um you know i was obviously significantly younger then so i was able to like be in front screaming like most of those times and then i'm our paths crossed with exodus in europe and they're like hey wait that's that guy that's always fucking yelling all the lyrics of bailoff uh because bailoff would be so fucked up and out of it um like a lot of times he wouldn't even be singing the words right i would be like yelling the correct words over him right. <laughs> and uh and then said so, then they're like wait that's that guy we heard he was in a band oh he's in a band and they're 
okay. So we kind of knew each other. And then when Zach quit, like he quit really abruptly. I don't know exactly what the story was. Um, I ended up getting a call from Gary and he was just like, well, random question. Like, what are you doing this weekend? And I was like, I, uh, nothing. I don't know. And he's like, you think you know enough access layers to like come sing for us in Mexico city this weekend? And I was like, yes. I had that moment of like, is this a good idea? Am I going to fail? Am I going to make an idiot out of myself? And I was like, fuck it. Let's just do it. Um, and I went and, you know, the show went really, uh, went really good. I think we did something like 16 songs or something. It was a really long set. Um, and they asked me if I wanted to go to South America with them afterwards. And I kind of, I, I didn't end up doing it for a bunch of reasons. One was I just started a new job working for a good buddy of mine. And right. I didn't want to just be like, oh yeah, so I quit. I'm just going to go do this now. Um, but the main one was, and I feel like enough time has passed and it's common enough knowledge to where I don't want to be, you know, I, I don't want it to be seen as like throwing shade, but the main thing I always knew about Exodus growing up in the Bay area was like, they were, they smoked a lot of meth and they were like fucking insane. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just thought to myself, like, I just had stopped doing exams and I was like, kind of, you know, kind of looking at sort of what am I going to do with my life kind of moment. And I also thought, I know full well, like Exodus is one of my favorite bands that, uh, if I was in that situation with just sitting there with like Gary and Rick, like, Hey, Ken, you want to smoke some meth? And I would be like, yes, Gary, hold Rick, you know, of Exodus. You guys are cool. I want to do what you're doing. Let's smoke meth. And I thought yeah. that's not good. Like I shouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't know that they were actually like, really, that was kind of the right when they were really getting clean and sort of getting their, their, their ducks in a row. And I was just too polite to be like, so if I'm going to smell South America with you guys, you guys going to fucking smoke meth the whole time? Or like, is it chill? Because yeah. I, I just I didn't have the balls. So I thought that would be really rude to say that. Mm. Um, and then they ended up working uh, like, and I thought about it for a while because I knew they weren't happy with, I think it was maybe Steve from Defiance and, and Skin Lab that did the yeah. South American dates with them. And I knew that they weren't happy with that. And I ended up calling Gary and I was like, are you guys still looking for a singer? But by that time they had started working with Dukes. Yeah. Um, yep. And, you know, and then that went on to be that. And now that's back and, you know, it's all awesome. But yeah, it was a really fun, crazy experience, man. Yeah, there you go. Everything worked out as it needed to, clearly. Yeah, it's odd, you know, I, I feel pretty good about it. Um, I definitely kind of was like, man, maybe I should have. But I mean, was, what can you do, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, when I say it worked out, I, I just caught up with Terry on 70,000 tons of metal, the cruise. Oh, cool. And, uh, that was great catching up with him, and uh, we did. We only had a very brief inter a discussion about Left to Die. So, can you tell oh, cool. me? How, can you? Can you? I know you guys have got a huge tour, mega tour coming up in throughout or Europe. In yeah. So, how, how did you get involved in that project? Uh, <laughs> uh, it's. I'll try to be concise. It's just it's so roundabout that like it doesn't really make sense unless. Um, it started out, they were doing the first Death to All tour, um, and they were going to have Stefan from Obscura do some stuff with it, but he couldn't get his visa approved to come to the States, so they called me at the last minute to step in and do, um, you know, some songs, some some later songs. And so I learned some songs on guitar and some songs I just sang because I only had like eight, eight days or something to learn, like, mm. you know pretty intricate fucking songs yeah. um, and anyway that that first tour as i'm sure is pretty public common knowledge it's kind of a shit show it's really disorganized and kind of a mess um and so they called me about the second one but by that point i had a scheduling conflict with exam that i thought well after the first one i don't want to like postpone my own shit to like go back out after the first one was kind of a shit show. Like I still have like the bounce check that they gave me at the end of the first tour. Oh, right, uh, yeah. it's a fun souvenir, but they, they had changed the management and they figured things out. And obviously that's all continued on and it's going, you know, gangbusters to this day. Um, so the, which is great, but I didn't do it, but we ended up playing a show with exhumed with that to all. And we were talking, the gruesome drummer, Gus and I were talking and we're like, Hey man, like, 
it's great that they're doing this. And, you know, it's really cool to see Sean and, and Paul and these guys playing all these songs. And Gus and I both had the same thing, though. They're like, how come nobody's calling Rick? How come no one's calling Terry? How come no one's calling Chris Ryford? How come no one's calling James Murphy? It and it's all people that are from the later era of the band. Like, what's up with that? And so we just kind of laughed, like, well, we said, oh, we should talk to the management and get, you know, either James or Rick and Terry and, you know, we'll play and we'll do all the old stuff. And I just sort of offhandedly was like, yeah, and if that doesn't work out, we'll just write our own death songs and make our own band. And that'd be hilarious. Ha ha. And then time passed and I ended up just writing a couple of songs that sounded like death for a goof. And I sent it to him. And then we started gruesome and then that sort of took off and took on its own thing, which really surprised the shit out of me. Mm. And because of that, a guy, uh, I forget who it was. Uh, oh yeah. Fucking Steven Gerlanger. They, they did a, a, a show in Florida with James Murphy and Terry, where we did spiritual healing straight through. And then Rick got wind of that. And, and he, I think he saw the show and was like, oh, you know, these guys, Matt and Gus can really play this stuff. And it sounds, you know, <clears throat> sounds pretty authentic. And he was, he hit up Terry and was like, do you think that they would want to do a leprosy thing? How do you think anybody would be interested? And Terry Wilson like, yes and yes. And so then that's sort of how Left and I came. <laughs> so it was just like, through this incredibly roundabout way we're basically back to doing exactly what Gus and I talked about at the very first drunk discussion, like at Death to All in Maryland backstage, which is, you know, playing the the songs that Rick and Terry worked on with them. So it's Man. fucking wild. It's crazy. So so the concept is to play songs from the from the era from leprosy as well as new songs that you've written. No, well, we've talked about maybe writing some songs. Um and it, every time we sort of discuss it, it sort of kind of just loses momentum. And, you know, my thing is that, you know, I, I would rather let Rick and Terry sort of be the ones pushing forward on that. Um, yeah. And obviously, I'm, you know, would want to come in and, and contribute. But I'm like, I have so many other kind of irons in the fire. I'm just like, I'm not going to put pressure on these guys. We need to do this. I'm just like, you know what? It's great. We can go out and play, you know, because... Rick obviously was in the band before he was in Mantis, you know, writing songs like, you know, Corpse Grinder and Evil Dead and Legion of Doom. And, you know, some of these songs that were getting reworked uh, for the first album, you know, like Curse of the Priest mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And both he and Terry toured for Screen Bloody Gore. So it's like we can play anything really from the first two albums and before. And people seem to be very happy with that. And with how busy everybody is, it's so hard to find a time that works for us to all get together, to be in the same place yeah. to actually do it. I'm just like, you know what? New songs, whatever if they happen. Great. And if they don't, this is already awesome. And, you know, basically I'm doing what I was doing in like ninth grade in my bedroom, except now like I'm doing it with Terry and Rick and people like pay me for it. So, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. You know what I mean? It's, it's pretty cool. Where do, where do you find the time to fit everything in? Because because <laughs> to your point, gruesome, yeah, it seemed to come out of nowhere, and boom, it's one of the the bigger grind bands around these days. So, yeah, I, I guess I'll wrap that point up and say, could could you ever imagine when you were that young fella back in school playing along to the Death and the Morbid Angel albums that you'd be <laughs> as successful as what you've ended up being? You know, I, I honestly, I think in high school it would kind of blow my mind that you know, 30 years on from, I mean, most of my favorite records really realistically are probably from like 89 in the death metal genre, you know, but it's like, which is now what, 35 years ago. It's uh, the fact, not the, the fact it, that autopsy it, is still playing shows, you know, even cannibal corpse, morbid angel, suffocation, uh, you know, carcass, napalm death, any of these bands, the fact that any of them are still active, um, would have blown my mind as a kid. I would have been like, what? That's insane. You know, that'd be like, I would think about it. Like, that'd be like my dad going to see like Paul Revere and the Raiders or like Moby Grape or whatever the <laughs> fuck. Um, and so, I don't know. On one hand, I kind of couldn't imagine it. And on the other hand, I think about it and it was like, well, I never really like, I didn't go to college or anything. So I never, and I really never pursued 
a career, you know, even like into my thirties, <laughs> which is not, I don't recommend that. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't really like I had a particularly good plan B. So it's like, well, at least this is, you know, more or less working right now. So I don't know. On one hand, I can't imagine that I, I could never have imagined it. And on the other hand, I guess deep down, I always did. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I'll make this my final question then for you. And it's an important one. When's, uh, the, book, well, when's the book coming out? The book? The autobiography. What What's that? The autobiography. Oh, boy. I mean, I, you know, weirdly, you're not the, 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 the first person to ask me about this, you might be like the, the third, but I think the thing is, you know, I'm not like an interesting person. You know what I mean? Like my own, my personal life is not interesting. And I think what sells a lot of those rock books is the personal story. Like I've never overdosed. Like I've only been to like, my experiences in jail are extremely vanilla. Like I got a drunk driving conviction one time. You know, like, uh, I'm, you know, I mean, I drink a lot and I've definitely done drugs, but I've never like, you know, had to suck dick for heroin or like overdosed or any of that stuff. You know, I'm, I never like accidentally or intentionally like killed a band member. So it's like really not, I'm not like an interesting, I mean, I, I mean, hopefully if somebody meets me, they're like, oh, he's nice or whatever. But I just mean like my life would be a very dull movie. It'd be like. Guy hears records, likes records, wants to make records, is kind of just like a dumb kid, eventually makes records, still is kind of a dumb kid, keeps making records, gets slightly less dumb and older. The end. It's not like a, there's no compelling, I've never dated like a model or fucking star or, you know, I'm just, I've never had a tragic death. So it's, you know, knock on wood. Um, so it'd be a very, it would be a very dull read. Uh, so probably never is the answer. That's a shame. That's a shame. I'm writing a book for a, an autobiography for a Norwegian black metal guitarist at the moment. And it's very much what you're saying. There's, there's none of the sex, drugs and rock and roll in it. A little bit, but that's, it's beside the point, really. It's, it's the touring. It's the interband relationships. It's the experiences at the venues, the management, sure. talking about nuclear blast and getting right in in the 90s when all of this stuff was where it just exploded, as you know. And I, I, I personally feel you're, you're one of those guys that have a heck of a story. I reckon once you start talking from – you just start from childhood and you just go right the way through. It'd be a fascinating story to retell. Well, you know, um, that's very kind of you and I appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, you don't want to get in touch with me. If you, if you, if you think it's that interesting, you know, you can feel free to hit me up. But uh, yeah, uh, to me, it's always about the work is what is interesting to me. And, and I think hopefully to other people, not, you know, <clears throat> like I said, I, I, I kind of, maybe I, I like pride myself on being kind of relaxed <laughs> and not, you know, it's like even like my mischievous experiences or whatever, they're all fairly safe and sane, you know, compared yeah. to yeah. even like a lot of people I know personally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, look, I, I believe that, a lot of the retelling of these sex, drugs, and rock and roll stories in in 2024 is, is very trite. Okay, because it is. because the the Motley Crue book said it all. Who, who could possibly vest what those experiences, the retelling of those experiences? They were so debaucherous yeah. that everything else just sounds tame in comparison. So then it inverts, and and I believe that there's a very intellectual angle to what we're doing. And there's an academic angle to it too. And God help me, if I'm trying to do anything, it's that. I'm trying to bring that that intellectual angle to things to actually say, hang on, this, this is a legitimate artifact, okay, and it needs to be treated that way. And your experience is as valid as, say, the retelling of, say, General Schwarzkopf from the Gulf War in 1991. That's, that's my take Storm on Nor, it. Storm and <laughs> Storm and Nor, remember? It's it's as important as doing that. And and uh, I'm only picking one person from history, by the way. But the, the, the point is, is that you've got a story to tell. It's an important story. You've contributed to modern culture in, in your own way uh, through a genre that the 
all the bullshit media out there have never, as you well know, have never cared about look right. down on us, think that we're the white trash hillbillies of music and all the rest of it. That's, and it's just and that's actually one of my favorite things about it, honestly. Yeah. Is that you're sort of picking something that is, you know, almost I would say like success proof because it's so <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just such like a, a subgenre of a subgenre of a subgenre kind of thing. And it's yeah. something that people don't take seriously. And I love, I love a challenging that, but I also love the absurdity of it. Yeah. And I, the, the whole death metal genre, I love, they're like, okay, so I really worked hard. Like I can play all these scales. I can do all this cool shit on guitar and it's awesome. And like, but we're going to just use all this ability to make music that is, you know, mostly unlistenable and then on top of it we're going to get you know somebody to to vocalize over it and not only are they going to just sing about a subject matter that is unpalatable using words that are often impenetrable and then delivering them in a way that's undecipherable it's like what an asshole move to do that it's fucking great <laughs> it's like it's just it's such a, it's a power move it, it is. It's like, it's just such a weird decision to make um, that I think I, I love, like I said, I just, I'm all about embracing the the sort of absurdity of it. And I, I think that's one, one of the few things that I got right from the, from the job of being into this music. I was like, yeah, of course it's ridiculous. Like, really? come on. Have you seen the cover art? This is fucking, yeah. it's like a cartoon, you know? <laughs> I, I remember you guys, I, I was a, Massive reader of uh, Metal Maniacs back in the day. Well, Liz, okay. Liz has obviously hooked us up. So, and uh, I, I, I remember reading about you guys in the. It wasn't in the demo pages. A couple of the writers there really championed your cause. And yeah, we were fortunate. But, but this is like 1997 and 1998 and stuff. And bands from America might as well have been bands from Mars for us in Australia. <laughs> yeah. So, so you're reading about these things, and there's no pictures of you or anything like that, but. There's a mystique, and there's something very engaging, and you're you're just doing your shit job, whatever it might be, your manual labour job, and you're thinking about exhumed, and you're thinking, I wonder what this band sounds like, and eventually you get the CD gore metal or what have you, and uh, you go, okay, like, this is worse than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, the same thing. I remember you guys and uh, Jungle Rod. I remember oh, cool. about the same time, and just the first time there, and uh, and and. As, as I say, mate, I, I, without laboring the point, it's it's a culturally what you're doing is a culturally significant artifact, and I think it needs to be honoured in that way. And I'm I've got I'm I'm doing my bit around it, and I hope more people do it. But uh, in, and and these days with the internet, given it's so it's all, the all pervasiveness of us that and that is the point. And the, the other thing is that we're all getting older. And yes. I, I, I spoke to Harvard, you know, Mortis the other night. I just caught up with him at uh, at his show oh. down, down here. At uh, He played on the Gold Coast. And um, I asked him the same question. He goes, well, I'm not done yet. And I said, well, the, the problem is, though, is that none of us are getting younger. And it's getting right. all those great stories are getting further and further in the rearview mirror. Okay, so it's it's just something that I've noticed that you don't think you're going to lose your memory of really important events, but it happens. I mean, you know, I'll go you one further. I mean, my my good friend Blake Harrison from Big Destroyer just died, you know, this past like a week and a half ago. Yes. So it's not just the memories that are getting further in the rearview mirror. It's like those sort of the opportunities, you know, um, to to talk about the stuff, to spend time with with people, and to you know, <clears throat> the, the there there is a weird point, you know, especially because this extreme music, a lot of it. Is coming from like almost like I don't know exactly. I, I haven't quite figured out how to pithily express it, but there's like a very sort of teenage mentality that it all stems from, right. where you have this. You can be fascinated with death and decay and darkness and evil and stuff because really you're pretty fucking insulated from it. Like you're so right. far away. Like presumably you're 15, 16. You, you're you know probably don't have health problems at that point you just barely got pubic hair you know <laughs> you're too young for you know cancer dementia arthritis whatever you know um and so you can sort of there's like a you can be really cavalier about these subjects at that age to where you just think like carbonized eye sockets is so fucking cool man 
to where I, I still think it's cool, but I think if I wasn't introduced to it and I was hearing it for the first time in my late forties, I'd be like, yeah, okay. Again, I rise. That's all right. What yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, so it's like, you kind of have to have this rascally attitude about it um, and come from there in order to still be here after all these years. And, um, you know, coming from that mentality, you don't really think about your own death outside of like a dramatic way. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, you, it's so abstract that it, it it's the, the conception of it is cartoonish compared to when you were, you know, middle aged. you're like, Oh yeah, my fucking friend just died. Yeah. You know, we can have cancer basically recovered, but he had so many health problems. He just fucking died last week. Like, and that's not yeah. the first time that's happened. You know, my, we all have, as time goes on, we lose more and more people and some of them, you know, are way too fucking young. So yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, it, it, it is important that we not only take time to record all this stuff, but also just, you know, try to value the experiences that we have and the opportunities we have, you know, yeah. while, while we have them. So. I mean, it's so true. And that's, I, I think I mentioned that to, to um, Mortis. I said, I was, I was talking about uh, writing the Cradle of Filth story from 1994, 1995 to 1999, that very important era. But uh, sure. Stuart, Stuart died. Stuart from Cradle died. And and he was going to be the guy that I would have had to, it would have been him or Nick Barker um, that I would have had to have worked with in order to have, for them to have editorial oversight about what I was writing right. to just check that things were where they needed to be because I can't write it out of thin air. I can write it using all of the interviews that I've done and and uh, other resources on the internet, but it's not enough. You need somebody to come right. over the top and and have that role and um, play that role. And and I'm I'm pretty sure he would have done it. Uh, we hadn't talked in detail, but he was supportive. So yeah, and that that's the point. To your point, it. Either either it's getting further and further away and our memories are getting worse or people are leaving us. And it's yeah. and it's I, I believe, and I was I said this to Bill Steer the other night from Carcass, so that music like what you're doing, uh, Matt, will be it's it's an artifact that'll be picked up in a hundred years' time by people. There'll probably be do you want to sound like Matt Harvey? This is how you do it with AI. Like there's an AI thing if you want to have because you were one of the first to do that sound that you've got. Well, uh, you know, the, I, I really appreciate you saying that. So that's really nice to hear. And, you know, um, who knows? <laughs> hopefully we'll, we'll be, uh, you know, hopefully that we're, we're, we're going to be able to talk again uh, in, in the future. Uh, but I, I appreciate everything you're saying if we, if we demo. So, yeah, for sure. Well, look, look, I'll once this book is done that I'm working on, I'll, I'll and it's out there. I'll send you uh, a copy of it anyway, just a you know an e copy or what have you, and um, oh, cool. I'll send you an e copy, mate. And if ever you're interested, I'm not believe me, I'm not going anywhere. So um, <laughs> hit me up. <laughs> All right, we'll do, man. Well, there you go. When it comes to the legends of the scene, those fellas that have been around for decades, it's always worth the wait. And there's Exhibit A, Matt Harvey from Gruesome. Exhumed and now with his own solo project toward the cold light. Magnificent. All right. If you like that one, there's plenty more over at scarsandguitars.com, especially if you're into Cradle of Filth, because I've had many conversations with ex members. We dive deep. Check it all out. All right. That's it from me. My name's Andrew Mackay Smith, and I'm the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast. Until the next one, it's a very good bye for now.